All right, ladies and gentlemen, seeing this on Facebook, YouTube, or whatever platform you're on, we have, as you guys have seen, the emails go out, the Facebook group, the event. We have an amazing guest here. I'll introduce him into one second, but I want to draw your attention. If you're on Facebook, I want you guys to go to the guides tab, check out all that amazing content that we have available to you guys and keep your eye out on the events tab. We have amazing guests that come in all the time, just like this gentleman right here that you're seeing his beautiful face. And we're going to talk about what that beautiful background is in just a moment. Um, but those of you guys that are new to the GSD, make sure you take advantage of all the content you have available to you guys. We have a free course available for you guys. So if you're a coach, a consultant, a business owner, we have content to help you with your offers, your sales, your execution, your delivery, your hiring process. We're all right here inside of this GSD group. So if you need that, just shoot us a DM or hashtag GSD in the comments. And now we're going to get into this brilliant content with my main man, Tim. Before, I'm going to give a little bit of a preemptive introduction for you and before you do your own, because it's just it's just fascinating what this guy's accomplished. And, and I've been following him for a long time. I think I may have even seen you speak on stage way back into those SEO conferences with like Rand Fishkin and um, what's his name? Yeah, uh, Search Engine Strategies. I started, did my first one of those probably about 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah, Rand Fishkin and and Bruce Clay. I grew up with yep. Bruce Clay's son and uh, got to hang out with all you guys. It was pretty fun and fascinating how everything's involved so far over the years. And Tim's one of the OGs. He's been around the block for a long time. He's like literally one of the authorities and you're about to find out why in like evolutionary psychology, digital marketing. If you see his background, those are international keynote speaking engagements. And he's a best-selling author, which we're going to talk about his book and how you can get access to it. Maybe even give away a chapter or so on unleashing your primal awesome. brain. And he's also, you've written a book on landing page optimization as well, right? Yeah, actually a couple of them. And so the second edition, it's been... Uh published in six languages and sold about 50,000 copies. That's a lot of marketing practitioners. So uh, I'd say it's probably the Bible in the field. Yeah, because you, but anyways, he, this guy's a top 10 digital marketing expert <laughs> ranked by Forbes, Entrepreneur Magazine. I mean, the influencers to watch. So I'm excited to, to talk to you about not only going into some war stories, how you came up and then how you evolved into like this brilliant speaker and author. So now you give your introduction. Well, I don't know. You you pretty much covered it. I guess uh, let's trace the arc of what I've done, which I think will be useful to your audience, and uh, uh, we'll just take it from there. I have, I yeah, you're right. I've written uh, some best-selling books, including my new one. We'll talk about that. I ran the conversion conference, which was the first international conference series about conversion rate optimization. Still goes on every year in Las Vegas, Berlin, and London. I'm very proud of that. Had a 10-year uh, run running that. Uh, have LinkedIn learning classes on neuromarketing, uh, consulting to help uh, businesses grow really fast uh, through my executive marketing advisory and some other services. Uh, but it's the, I think for your audience, it's the how I got here that's going to be more interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Like, so, so tracing all the way back to the beginning, beginning Tim, just getting started in digital marketing and carving your footprint, like did you do, were you one of the guys that like a lot of people do, which is like, I do it all. I can do landing pages. I can do banner ads display back well, then. Well, none of that existed when I started. I started in the mid nineties. Okay. So I'm, when you said I'm the OG, I mean, that's a polite way of saying you're ancient, dude. <laughs> I, I come on these things just to feel young, apparently. Cause I, I tell Rahul, he's an OG for 2004. You're, you're back in, in the 90s. 95. Yeah. <laughs> that's when I started my first agency future focus and we were helping launch.coms. And um, we'd also help them get funding, be acting CTO on their boards, typically uh, get, get them raises of money and so on. But this was really, really early days. And so then we transitioned into pay-per-click marketing. And again, early days on that, there was a company called GoTo that became Overture that got bought by Yahoo Search. And we were one of the original bidding tool vendors, which meant that we would come up with these algorithmic ways to manage large portfolios of paid keywords. So like trying to bid right up to somebody else so that it costs them more money or try to keep a certain fixed position. It was like the early days of pay-per-click automation. And so we ran large scale pay-per-click campaigns for companies. And then we decided that the super affiliate field was blowing up. So we said, well, you know, we know how to drive quality traffic. 
let's put our own money at stake and try to drive it to, to you know, affiliate landing pages. Well, the only problem with that is most of those sucked um, really badly. So we said, you know what, let us help you fix those landing pages and we'll all make a lot more money, not just off of the traffic we're sending, but all of your other affiliate traffic. And so we, through the back door, got into conversion rate optimization. And that's how my uh, previous agency, Site Tuners, was born around 2000. Uh, so I guess you could say there have been a lot of pivots along the way. And, uh, but that's what we're really known for. Site Tuners um, created over $1.2 billion in value for the Expedias, Googles, Facebook, Siemens, um, you name it, of the world. And uh, we're probably like the, the most well, in terms of documented success as the most successful conversion rate optimization agency. That's amazing. Yeah, we, we did something similar, a different approach, but sort of similar in our world in the sense that we were helping people with just the banner ads, not actually placement yet. We, were, we saw there was a lot of opportunity and everybody had an ad back then. That was the way to go. Banner yep. ads, animated yep. gifts. So we would just click their ad, go to the one, scroll down to the bottom of the page, hit email, call them, bug them, and then sell them banner ads. We'd sell them <laughs> dozens at some point. And that was how we got in. And then we started backing into saying, well, if, we're, if our ads are converting better, maybe our traffic management would also convert better and get you more. So we kind of yeah. took a little bit of a similar approach, just ads to manage their, their media. So that's kind of interesting. Now, when you're, when you're coming into, like, were you always working with large brands or did you ever work with like the small guys? Oh, no, it's, it's a wide range. I mean, of course, I'm going to mention the big marquee clients, the right. ones we made the most money for because of the scale they were operating at. But we work with startups as well across all vertical industries, B2B, B2C, uh, you name it. So I, I've seen it all from uh, travel to financial services, to education, um, of course, e-commerce, tons and tons of clients in e-commerce. So yeah, when we were you generalist, were... Our, our focus was conversion rate optimization. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so, and still so the is service the agency. Was, yeah. The service is the niche. The the clientele was if if it was a good fit, budget wise, personality match, et cetera, long term. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, I, I stepped out of an active role in site tuners about three years ago, as well as the conference, and decided that I'm going to focus on the keynote speaking, uh, solo consultancy, the book, the LinkedIn learning course. Uh, just realized that running a professional services firm wasn't my highest and best use on the planet. Yeah, totally. And, and one, one thing I do want to mention is like just getting started, like when you're in the beginning stages, like how much, how hard was it to get to like, keep going, I guess, is my first question. Like, when did you run into issues first year, second year where you're like, shit, this is fucking harder than I thought. Uh, yeah. I mean, to well, pretty, to, like, pretty much like, constant. Going. I mean, I think you have to, as an entrepreneur, you have to have boundless self-confidence uh, tempered by not being a jackass. And what I mean by that, it's a real tension. On the one hand, you have to say, you know, I don't care what you think. In fact, fuck you, I'm going to do it anyway. On the other hand, it's throwing good life after bad, right? When, when are you just like hitting your head against the wall and need to stop and go do something completely different? It's a real tension and there's no obvious answers to that. And then you get psychologically sucked into it and you just wake up. And, oh, I just spent four years doing that. Right. 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 Yeah. Cause I mean, one thing I wish I it's, it's simple, but I wish I would have known this earlier and a lot in the moment, I don't really realize it. Or a lot of people don't, especially the people we speak to oftentimes is that everybody overestimates what they can accomplish in a year, but they mm -hmm. underestimate what can be accomplished in five or 10 years. So it's like, we're always chasing that one inch in front of our nose sometimes. And then when one thing works, you're like, Oh my God, let's do more of that. And then that stops working. Let's pivot our whole lives and go somewhere else. Like, how did you stay so focused into just staying the course into that one domain? Uh, well, I, like I said, we, we switched. So we started designing some of the first database driven websites. I'm talking like in the nineties with mm -hmm. you know, Oracle backends uh, in the raw kind of stuff, then uh, moved to pay-per-click, then moved to affiliate marketing, then moved to conversion rate optimization. So it, it's not like you, you have to evolve. Mm -hmm. I think one of the keys to figuring out what kind of business you want is, do you want to just do a well-understood low margin thing, essentially a commodity thing, or do you want to do something that's more you know, high-end and difficult, doesn't, isn't understood by a lot of people? So we were always swimming against the tide because we wanted to be like the high priests of whatever we were doing. So we had to adapt to the technology because 
my agency was run by really, really smart, capable, expensive people. They, we couldn't have them do kind of stupid stuff that you can outsource to Upwork. <laughs> right. I was probably the opposite of you when I started. And, and what kept me in the like the lower end, higher volume game was I, I cold called the company called Huge Incorporated. And at the time they were representing <laughs> like um, Taco Bell, JetBlue, HBO, like like when I say media, they're running everything, their back end, their front end, their their strategy, everything. They're like basically like attorneys of record, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, yeah uh, agency of record. Yep. Yeah, and the guy, Aaron Shapiro, I don't know if he's still there, but this was many years ago, a decade or more. And he's like, how the fuck did you get my phone number and get on my calendar? <laughs> but while you're here, go ahead. <laughs> and uh, he's, he just said, look, at the end of the day, you want to make a lot of money. At the end of the day, we all want to have the freedom. Now I have to go dress up in a penguin suit and go meet in Rio de Janeiro with Taco Bell. And I don't want to go, but I make a lot of money doing it on your end. I can give you my work to my creative consultant. He's going to say, Aaron, why the fuck are you sending this guy to me? And you're really good at the low end, but at the end of the day, you want to make a lot of money. So just be really good at what you're good at rather than chase. What yeah. Other yeah. What I'm at. saying is it's a conscious decision. Okay. Oh so yeah. Conscious. That, decision, so, yeah. so at the business model level, you have to say, look, I'm going to, I'm a community builder or I provide professional services or I build software. I mean, first, what kind of business are you in? And then within that, you have to say, hey, I'm at the high cutting edge of it or I'm in the uh, turn the crank and things come out uh, with consistency on the other end at the commodity side of it. That's fine, too, as long as you you have the right cost structure. So there's no right answer here. I'm just saying be super clear about what you're doing and why you're doing it and whether your temperament is suited for it. Totally. How many, how many keynotes have you spoken at with everything behind you? I, it's, I, I can't, I'm trying to like count. In my I, you head know, like, I, like I stopped counting at a couple hundred. Uh, that's that, that wall extends. That's my wallpaper for literally for the whole wall. So uh, out of I, all of those, what, which one would you say is most memorable for you? Oh, geez. So many memories. I, I love international travel. And so I've been back to, well, to, today it's a, not a good place to talk about, but I was born in the former Soviet Union in Moscow. Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I love going back there because I freaked them out when I started speaking Russian on stage and showing black <laughs> and white pictures of me in kindergarten in Moscow. Uh, they weren't expecting that. Uh, but also Brazil, Australia, uh, Spain, Romania, England, Germany, I could go on. The, the Probably the most kind of baller time was a conference I did in Brazil where they had 12,000 people, two four-story tall jumbotrons flanking me. And I came out on a catwalk with a rounded dais that was in the middle of the audience. <laughs> so we're really in the presence of greatness here. <laughs> yeah, you guys are lucky out there in Facebook land or wherever you're watching this. Give me a hashtag live or a hashtag replay. And if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the comments. You can tag myself or Tim or Cody. And we'll we, certainly... do, we do have a couple of questions. I mean, one yeah. right off the bat was just like, what mindset? Philip's asking, what mindset change helped you grow your business the most? Like, what do you what do you attribute mm. along the way that you kind of? that kind of helped you amplify your success? Yeah, well, uh, the first one I would say, um, well, one is just the mindset's got to be resiliency. I don't know if it's a change, but uh, it's almost like um, one of those demolition derby things where you hit the wall, you hit other cars, you know, as long as the motor's still working, keep going. 90% of it's showing up. That's the way I see it. Um, And then the other thing I would say is that, um, not doing it yourself. And I suck at a lot of things. I mean, if you look at all of my personality tests I've ever done, they all say I'm an evangelist. Um, I'm the idea guy. My follow through sucks. I, I'm the guy that would rather have three dental cleanings a year than floss my teeth every day. I'm that guy. Okay. And so that means finances, operational stuff always fell through the holes. And until I got a business partner that wanted to do that stuff, and that was their highest and best use, then things got a lot easier. So I'd say, um, don't try to backfill your weaknesses, try to find people whose strengths those are. Yeah, I would, I would, I would say yours and I, I, my personality are fairly similar because Cody's my partner here and you kind of spoke to, he's probably more well-rounded than me, but when I have an idea, I have to give it to him and then he has to document it. Then he has to map it out. Then we talk about execution. So probably a similar relationship, I imagine if we had more time. Yeah, well, they've shown that uh, in terms of starting new businesses, that your chances of success go up by 80% if you have a second partner involved. And it's Mm -hmm. largely, I believe for that reason, because they're covering things that they're good at and that also need to be done. 
Yeah. And there's also a nice little balance as well. When, if he's busy, I can take on some of the workload. If I'm busy, you can take on some of the workload, but also you have that relationship. It really truly is. It's like, it's like almost, I don't want to compare it to a marriage, but it's sort of like a marriage, but you spend more time with your business partner than you do with a family. Oh, it is. So here's the ironic part. When I started Future Focus, I brought in an ex-girlfriend of mine and she, and even though we hadn't ended up together, she was like my work wife for over 20 years. So uh, yeah, it it is kind of like a marriage, including the bickering part sometimes. Oh yeah. (laughs) We've had a few of those. No comment, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's awesome. So like, give me a time where like you almost threw in the cards and what, what got you or if you ever did, or how close you were to that, that got you out. Because when you mentioned 90%, like the bumper cars, demolition derby, 90% just keep going if the motor is going. Sometimes it's hard, even though the motor is still running. Yeah, well, you know, there's um, there were several, it got tough when I got married and had kids. Uh, that was about, having kids was about 10 years after I started my first company. Mm-hmm. And then the stakes are different. It's like somebody still has to bring home a paycheck. You know, you have to take care of your kids. You can't be traveling all the time and all of these things. So something had to give. And I had two or three times when my wife and I had conversations uh, along the lines of, Hey, if you can't reliably bring home this much money in such and such a time frame, like six months from now, then you have to go and get a real job. You know, and I said to her, well, I, okay, understood, but you understand, I'd rather be like the bear caught in the trap and chew my leg off than go work for somebody else. Right. Um, so luckily it never came to that, but there were some close calls where there, we had those kind of conversations. Yeah. I, I remember my war story was losing one marquee client and this was early on. And it was a pretty large account for, for at least for me and uh, lost it after about three and a half years. We expected it to last like six months, but it went about three and a half years. And uh, cause they went through vendors, like they went through like underwear sort of. <laughs> and um, anyways, I remember the guy gave me a six month notice. He's like, Hey, we're going to be firing in six months. So do as much work as you possibly can bill us for in those next six months. So I just right. looked at it as like, you're never going to get rid of me. I'm too sticky. I'm too good for this brought in a new CEO. They're like, all right, last day. I'm like, oh shit, this is real. I think I took about 24 hours to reflect and just go to the park by myself, do my little cry for 10 minutes, 20 minutes. And I'm like, all right, I got two binary options. I got to think A or B, cry like a little bitch and give in and tell everybody I give up or just do what I'm probably going to do anyways, is get back on the high horse. So when tough things come, I just try to think A or B, like one is give up, B is don't give up. Yeah. And, but the, the thing that I'd say also, uh, Cody, in answer to, to the listener's question of like you know, big pivots I made, I, I went through several transformations and uh, in terms of what we did, how we charged for it, everything from performance based to fixed price, project, hourly, we tried it all, right? And, and then what, we, what services we delivered. But the biggest change for me was actually this last stage where three years ago, I consciously chose to become a solo consultant and, and uh, solopreneur, I guess you'd call it. Um, so my other tip is understand your personality because you're always bringing that with you and it's unlikely to change. So if it's something is against type, it's like swimming against a riptide, you know, just, um, uh, again, I was I was stubborn and I was pretty good. So I could run a professional services firm or a couple of them for a span of 25 years. But that's not what gave me juice in life. And so mm-hmm. the stuff I'm doing now where I get to do advisory consulting with at the top uh, level at companies uh, or new startups, that's what I enjoy. And well, like, why do I need employees? Why do I need um, this, all of this other stuff, just to say, I'm the CEO of an agency. So I think a lot of it is self-knowledge. So take all those personality typing tests, figure out what environment you thrive in and, uh, go do more of that. The I world absolutely is- love that, honestly, because like I, I express to like our students and our, our, our people a lot, not to always worry so much about just wanting to, to do more, 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 or whatever you think you're supposed to be doing and, and to monitor their energy levels. Right. And that's what you yeah. kind of touched on. There was like, you know, what gets you juiced up? What, what fires you up? That might not be running a team of 25 people and having yeah. hundred clients or, or and- making money. Okay. I know GSD and all that, but <laughs> in, there, there have been scientific studies about happiness and the difference between being a working person and being independently wealthy. There is a statistically 
uh, significant increase in happiness. Okay. It's 3%. You are 3% happier being independently wealthy. It's not that, but, but how much of our time do we sink into that? How much of our life force, how many years, how many ruined relationships, how many lost opportunities to make friends or, or raise our own children? You know, it's, it's a high price. So I think in a way we're really out of balance. So what I'm saying is just do the stuff that feeds you as a human being the whole time. Don't ever give that up for anything. Okay. Yeah. At some point in time, I think we all chase something that is against the grain, like you mentioned, swimming against the current, because maybe that's what other people are doing. It's like this person's successful doing this. Let me try to copy rather than well, match. The, yeah. And then what again, what's successful? You mean financially? Yeah. Okay. Well, they're also a dick, you know, and or, <laughs> yeah. or they never see their children. I mean, again, to me, those are really high price to pay. Um, right. Because I mean, a lot of you don't need a lot of money to be happy or you could need a lot of money to be happy. I mean, the unique part is you get to choose. So, yeah. Like, and, and then also it's just a, the, but you're right. We we're surrounded and we're comparing ourselves with, you know, everybody's hustling. Everyone's pivoting. Everyone's a unicorn or wants to be one. You know, it's it's so you get caught up in that keeping up with the Joneses. And it's really nothing more than um, just kind of by osmosis, the cultural values that are being transmitted by the people around us. I mean, what if you stepped off the gerbil wheel and actually had a conscious thought about what makes you happy? Totally. Just the thought. <laughs> right. No, hundred percent. And, and guys, whoever's here live, let me get a hashtag Tim, because he's going to be sharing some, some stuff about his book and how you guys get access, maybe a gift or so, but a little hashtag Tim in the comments, smash that heart button, the like button, thumbs up on YouTube. Once it gets there, um, Tim, I want to go into a war story. Like some, sure. let's go into some agency war stories. We'll see who has, and you guys get to vote which one's your which one's the most terrifying to you <laughs> between me Cody and- oh man okay well how about this for starters i might as well start off with a bang i was running an agency and and uh, when i get uh under stress which is 95 percent of the time running an agency uh i became a micromanaging asshole okay a driver and didn't didn't really um pay attention too much to my employees and so they kind of had a revolt. And uh, so my sales guys and my uh, one of my top guys went off, started their own agency and stole some of my clients. And I had to sue them. <laughs> okay. There's a, that's a, that's a How's that for a war story? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, let me let me give you one that maybe isn't as good as that. I'm, I was going to go, in, we'll go into a client one, maybe if we have some time as well. Uh, but yeah, I had a similar situation, Heidi, um, and went, went off the reservation on a couple of people, Julian, who introduced me and Tim together, mm-hmm. who's been in here live, old employee. Not only did he leave, he went downstairs in the same fucking building to a competitor <laughs> and, then, and I'd have to walk by, see him every single day. And then he tried to recruit two people from me. One person <laughs> went and I'm like, it doesn't get any closer than this. Cause all they have to do is drive to the same fucking parking lot <laughs> and, and to top things off the, that agency was in the, in the office that I started my business in. So they were downstairs. I was upstairs. I, that used to be my office suite number one Oh two. So it had mm-hmm. more insult to injury because when I parked my car, I had a reserved spot. It faced my old office. So I have to see <laughs> in the window, <laughs> like, Can't get away time. from it. Yeah. So like Julian's in my old office <laughs> doing sales. But the unique part about Julian was he was cool enough that we didn't go ballistic on each other every single time. just occasionally that I joke with him that he referred me a client that ended up becoming a six figure client for us. And I'm like, man, I'm like, now that I don't pay you, you make me more money. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, if you're, if you're talking about the agency game, one other tip I'd give is really watch out for concentration. I mean, we had some uh, one count that was you know, seven figures a year to us. So it was about at the time, two thirds of our recurring revenue. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they just went away. And like, like you, they lasted a long time. We were thought like six to 12 months was like two and a half years, but one fine day it's like, boom, two thirds of your recurring revenue walks out the door. So, uh, the, the way we dealt with that was having smaller accounts, uh, lower entry point, but having a lot more of them. So you have that portfolio risk goes down and the one, one thing's not going to take you out. But yeah. I think it's inevitable in the agency game too. I don't know if you've ever watched Mad Men, that TV series. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's like the great quote from Don Draper, who's this Madison Avenue guy. And he's, and they were celebrating, like they want a big account, like Lucky Strike or something. And he says, enjoy it. But remember one thing, the day you get a client is the day you start losing them. 
Ah, uh, that's hilarious. I told you that quote. Remember, Rahul, I use that all the time. People, yeah. It's the day they sign the check is the day they start looking for a way to fire you. <laughs> yeah, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But maybe I'm misquoting, but that same idea. And it's true because if you're delivering high-end professional services, there's going to be an expectation mismatch. What have you done for me lately? Uh, somebody leaves. The company has a reorganization. One time we made Autodesk. Um, we did a split test on redesigning one of their product websites, made them $37 million, it would have been in extra leads for them. And instead of flipping the switch and making that live, they all of a sudden from on high, they got the, the order that, oh, now we only care about net promoter score. Well, not real money. I mean, never mind the 37 million, right? It's like, what? You know, so all kinds of bizarre stuff will happen. So make sure you don't have just one big account that you're relying on. Yeah. And when we're talking about concentration, like if you only have a few accounts, don't make those small accounts your biggest attention, go get more, give them a certain portion of attention. Cause I see a lot of people who have like two to three clients or maybe under 10, right around that range, maybe 10 to 20 grand a month or so. But then you're so bored that you only focus on those clients and you only call those cause you have nothing else to do. Go get more clients, get a system mm -hmm. in place yeah. and it's okay to not all the time, but it's okay if you reinvest in the business and get somebody to help you with shit you don't like to do. Mm -hmm. Maybe an executive assistant, maybe it's a setter. Or, or outsource it. Out. Or I mean, like that, yeah. Like I said, I, I in my agency, uh, when I started Site Tuners, I, I, we were too top heavy, frankly. It was a, you know, too many chiefs and not enough Indians, as they say. And so um, now my close friend and business partner who's running Site Tuners, um, he, he figured out how to do it. The client facing, super smart US based people and the developers in Latin America and uh, Romania and other places. I mean, that's, that's the only way to run a modern agency at any scale. You, you definitely have to take advantage of that. I mean, there's all kinds of complications that come with that and working across time zones, different cultures, accountability. Uh, but uh, yeah, you have to be super clear about your cost structure too. No, definitely. Cause that's interesting. You say that. Cause like when, after I lost that, that one deal, it, I was super, I was so concentrated on that one deal. It was also seven figures a year. That was my only client. So that's when it stung a lot, Ouch. Uh, but we, we, yeah, so that that's, yeah. So three and a half years of running one individual client. So then, like after that high horse moment decision, literally this is, couldn't have been scripted any better. The company across the street was also publicly traded. And they're facing each other, but across mm -hmm. the street, got them as a client about a week later. Um, so that's when I built the actual agency underneath it, where I'm like, oh, I can't have one client because if yep. they also go there, which they're going to do, all good things come to an end. Um, we have to not be fucked. So mm -hmm. I hired a team with all the extra cash flow, a number two that can run the team. So I don't have to talk to anybody. My whole thing was like, just if they have ideas, go to him. And he'll bring it to me. And if he approves it, that means it's approved for everybody. So he was like a godsend, if you will. We yeah. just kind of ran the whole thing where I didn't really have to do a lot. Yeah, you know, on one it. of the things we, we did this uh, great exercise with an organizational consultant in the early days of, you know, first five, seven years of the agency. And he said, draw me the org chart for the agency at scale. What does it look like? What are all the responsibilities? Who reports to whom? All that. He said, okay, now fill it in with who's doing that function right now. Ooh, that's and so with all the employees we had, we had about a dozen at that time. Turned out I was wearing literally 17 hats, including right. the CEO hat. And he said, okay, now where do you want to end up? Okay, CEO, what are the specific triggers in which you work your way out of each role? Okay, when we hit a certain uh, sales revenue, we're hiring a sales manager. Got it. Okay, when we're hit a certain headcount, we're going to hire an HR person. Okay, when we hit a certain, you know, whatever. You, you basically figure out specific points at which you're, you're going to work your way out of that role and into the only role you want. I thought that was a brilliant exercise. I recommend that is a cool it. exercise. I love that. Yeah. I'm writing that down as you speak. <laughs> <laughs> All you guys write that down too. That was, that was, that was a gem right there. Like that, that right there is actually such a great future pace map for yourself because mm -hmm. at first like you have high energy where you can wear all the hats in fact if you're a micromanager you're the agency it's your baby it's okay it's okay to know that well, well actually it's not okay but everything i know from evolutionary psychology you know people talk about multitasking that's total bull i mean there's no such thing you can only pay conscious attention to one thing at a time and all of that context switching, if you keep interrupting yourself and changing hats all the time, it, it actually means you're just 
basically completely unproductive and all of your time is spent switching tasks and not being in deep focus. So it's not good for anybody, even early on, but it's necessary, unfortunately, and it makes it difficult. Right. No, I didn't give Cody a chance to talk about what was your horror story? My horror story? Yeah. Um, I, I am honestly just going to end up repeating you guys. I had one client and they screwed me, but they screwed me. Mine was a little bit worse because I was off on vacation on like a four month trip to Europe. That I take. She's four months. We don't yeah. feel so bad anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when a person thinks that they're, they're all secure and ready to rock, you know, I go on these long vacations pre, you know, pre lockdowns and all the crap we go through now. Um, and about like halfway through my biggest client, which was about 80% of our revenue, just, just cut. No, no, you know, and it's how it works. You don't get any warning. And this is the stuff that you got to learn as an agency. And for all you guys out there, like there's an 80, 20 rule in business. A lot of businesses do have 80% of the revenue tied up in one or two accounts. It's not a good thing to do, but it's something that happens frequently. Uh, and when that cuts and you've got people who rely on you um, and you're halfway across the world, not, not worrying about trying to acquire new business at the time, like I was, it was a, it was a spiral moment. Mm -hmm. So I guess instead of sitting in a park, I got to sit on a side of a thing in venice so it was a little bit better for my little <laughs> breakdown moment but... <laughs> yes, he's, he's a little younger cody's still in his 30s so like he's the fancy fancy agency owner uh, <laughs> but go like with this audience like younger agency owners maybe mm -hmm. the solo guys um what are some tips that you can can share um, okay, on getting so... a client on getting clients like what well, would you recommend well, actually, I'm, I'm going to switch on just how to be more effective. I'm going to broaden it okay. out. And so one thing that I really um, am glad I did is back in the day, I joined something called YEO, the Young Entrepreneurs Organization. Okay, okay nice. now it's called EO because they figured out that aging out <laughs> your, your customers at age 40 was probably a bad idea. So anyway, now it's not age dependent. But I was in a peer group. Now they're in different industries, but basically we were all running a business. And civilians don't understand. Your, your partner won't understand. Your, your kids won't understand. Your best friend won't understand. You may love them and you know, have the same taste in movies, but it's basically the way I describe it. It's like being a combat veteran versus a civilian. Now, I don't know what combat is like. I've never been in combat, luckily for me, but um, you know, civilians don't understand. People that are not entrepreneurs don't understand entrepreneurs. So you need at least at a minimum, a peer group. Um, so I, I strongly recommend joining things like that. It could be a mastermind. It could be, well, whatever. There's a number of ways to, to get that need met. Um, but even more importantly, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're not that smart. The, the, when my business became a lot more effective is when I started working with mentors. And so, uh, and I think life stage, yeah, having no hair or gray hair, you know, that comes, you, you get some experience with that. So I think there's an arrogance among younger agency heads. They think they know what they're doing and it's about the technology and what the hell do you know, grandpa, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. But in fact, there's a lot of not just war stories, but ways of thinking that produce a kind of an economy and an efficiency of action that you don't get for free. And if you try to learn them through taking your own lumps, it's going to take you many, many years. So that's actually one of the, my solo consulting services I created was called the executive marketing advisory. It's essentially, I'm like a shadow CMO. I'm like that core jester that to mix metaphors that doesn't have a dog in the fight. So I can speak truth to power and help in any way that I can. And I'm basically unlimited on call for an agency head or a senior marketing executive inside a company. And we can talk MarTech, we can talk about your team, your people, your business model, you know, any number of things. Um, and I think that having a mentor, that's just one type, that's a subject matter mentor, but um, having a mentor, somebody that can pull you along is uh, instead of you climbing the hill by yourself is super important. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, I think it's all hindsight, right? I mean, you try to go at it on your own. Some people realize that sooner than rather than later, mm -hmm. maybe you had entrepreneurs in the family that could possibly give you a head start of what that even looks like. Of the mindset. Of the, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's how my family was. My dad was an entrepreneur, always working and he he's probably 
was much smarter than I was when at my age, in the sense that he constantly paid people. He always wanted to find the edge. And mm-hmm. I remember in, in, he told me a story about in like 19, like late 1980s or maybe early 1990s, he paid Jay Abraham $50,000. And I'm like, well, what did you get? And he's like a one page letter. And that mm-hmm. was it. And he's like, <laughs> but that letter resulted in millions of dollars once fueled by marketing dollars behind it. Yep. Like it was, he recognized that all we needed to be good at was this one message for this one product. So this one audience that back then, no internet computer shopper, Tim may have built my parents' fucking website, central software services.com. It was flashing <laughs> and moving. It was really high tech stuff. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah. No comment. We'll neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was uh but I agree. Mentorship is one way that, because things like this, we want to share knowledge. We want it to go viral. We want to give tips, some boost of inspiration, but when you want to get the juice and that constant help, um, then it's just a matter of that's when you want to scale up and maybe. Yeah. And, 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 you know, if it's expensive, if it seems expensive, pay it because it's worth it. I'm not saying there are no charlatans out there or anything like that, but um, it's, uh, I mean, you don't think anything of paying a plumber when your toilet's backed up a hundred bucks an hour. And it, you know, there's professional services and I'm not saying mentors, but a professional services that cost 75 or hundred or 125, and you go, Oh, that's a lot. Someone's getting rich. Well, no, not really, because they're also not working a steady thing. And it's the collective experience you're paying for. It's like, uh, well, there's a, f- a famous story about Picasso toward, uh, towards the end of his career. He was in, in Paris and uh, this woman comes up to him in a cafe and asks if, he could uh, just sketch her portrait. So like on a napkin or paper plate or something, he just does this sketch and gives it to her and he goes, okay, that'll be 5,000 francs. And she's like, 5,000 francs. That just took you five minutes. And she was really offended. And he goes, no, madam, it took me my whole life. And so exactly. remember what you're paying for is that lifetime of experience and that one insight. It looks easy because of all the pain and preparation and all the stuff that had to be learned along the way. I mean, you get that gratification way faster when you can buy. You get it immediately, yeah. Yeah, and and buying somebody else's mistakes and going down the right path. It's almost like in today's world, I don't think anybody would drive in an unknown area that has internet reception or 5G or 4G without ways or or some sort of maps, right? And But when you're operating the agency sometimes or the marketing or the business, a lot of people are operating without that GPS system that's right in front of them that they could have. Yep. That course correction, that one that says, Hey, there's a traffic jam up ahead. I wouldn't go that direction. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Totally. So let's talk about the the book and, and what you're up to and, and how people can get their hands on this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, my first book uh, for any online marketing practitioners is called, this is the second edition of it. It's called Landing Page Optimization. And it's everything that I knew when I wrote it about that subject. And uh, it's, um, it's pretty practical. The second one, the, or uh, this new one, rather, is called Unleash Your Primal Brain, Demystifying How We Think and Why We Act. And as I mentioned, you know, we had a lot of documented success when I ran my agency site tuners, but most of it was based on durable neuromarketing principles. As far as I'm concerned, All of marketing is based on persuasion and persuasion in turn is based on influencing people to act and how we act and how our brain works is really foundational to that. If you want to peel it back one more layer, how our brain evolved and retracing that whole arc of evolution and what we picked up along the way, that's the foundation of everything. So evolutionary psychology, if you want to be successful, personal development, your relationships, business, marketing, leadership, it doesn't matter. It's all evolutionary psychology. And so there was no good guidebook to that out there. It was either like scientific stuff or siloed people like medical imaging or behavioral economists or, um, you know, online funnel builders. Everyone was talking about from different perspectives. So I kind of wrote the easy to understand, super condensed, no fluff book um, on it. It's also available as an audio book uh, that I recorded myself as well as an ebook, but it's called Unleash Your Primal Brain. Uh, and you can get more info and a free chapter. This is, I think, what you're alluding to. Who wants to. a free chapter? Free chapter of your, <laughs> of your choice. So go look at the table of contents, pick which one would be most interesting to you, and I'll send it to you. 
at primalbrain.com slash book. That's where you can, you can uh, do that. Just fill out we'll, the form we'll and get it. whatever. We'll drop it in the, we'll drop it in the notes here and we'll tag everybody on that. But yeah, make and, sure you- and if somebody wants information about my uh, consulting services, obviously I do public speaking. I haven't mentioned that part, but um then just go to timash.com and that describes all of my services. I can help in a with tactical website reviews, coming up with internet strategy, training marketing teams or agencies, or the advisory, the executive marketing advisory that I mentioned. They're all described in detail on, on timash.com. Yeah, guys, everybody that's out there on the replay and also who's here live, um, do get a copy. I would suggest Cody, did you, Cody just dropped the link right now. Everybody go there right now and click it because I know once this is over, we may get too busy to do things. Grab your favorite copy or your favorite chapter right now. Yeah. And because- it could be anything. It could be storytelling, how we evolved to spread culture, memory, learning, uh, sleep. I mean, gender differences. It's all in there. Beautiful. Like when I come to San Diego, do I take you to a cup of coffee or you're going to take me to one? <laughs> let's go let's go surfing instead no i'm just oh, kidding man. i don't surf no, but how about a hike yeah a hike a hike will be just fine i can do that don't know how to surf <laughs> okay <laughs> just yeah i was just messing with you okay cool awesome well thank you so much for being on here and spending your time i know you're busy um but i appreciate you sharing everything like those the not only the war stories but just like the mentality is such an important part and i love the fact that it even led into the book the the primal brain because i think like not only understanding human psychology instead of like you mentioned going against the currents um, is such an important part and the sooner people learn that the more they'll unlock and unleash themselves of what they truly love what really matters and how not to fight against something that's not worth having a dog in that fight yeah exactly i I think like i said evolutionary psychology is foundational for any marketer so if there's one thought about the book i want to leave you with it's not about the technology it's about the evolutionary psychology awesome guys all right well thank you so much for being here tim we really appreciate your time and joining us on the gsd show here (laughs) it is my pleasure thanks guys